Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine War update extra video. I'm having such trouble knowing what I'm actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is an update extra video giving the extra tidbits and nuggets to get you teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Having listened back and edited this video, there are some moments where my voice, the mic clips off, or actually the software clips off some of my words. I think it's a noise reduction settings so apologies for that if that's a little bit annoying throughout this video i need to mess around with the settings again to make sure that that doesn't happen i irritated myself while editing uh, i'm going to add a little bit from a an excerpt of the extra video i did yesterday that i cut out because i the video was too long i'm going to pack that on to the end of this video but before we get there, let's talk about the Ukrainian army's corral. Uh, that's, I think that's spelt with a K as well, missiles. So we heard this morning that the Ukrainians are trying to develop uh, a range of air defense missiles and capabilities themselves, indigenous production of this. And Euromaidan Press here talks to that. Ukraine's defense ministry has named strengthening air defense, including the development of corral anti-aircraft missiles among its priorities for 2024. Uh, so what is this, particularly this corral missile? Well, back in June 2021, before Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Lukč Design Bureau presented a new guided anti-aircraft missile corral for medium-range systems. So they said back then corral should work against ballistic targets. Uh, that's really significant if it can work against ballistic missiles for example that's uh, super important of course not all classes but it must work on ballistic targets the ballistic targets are harder to shoot down due to their higher speed the cruise missiles will fly lower to the ground and move around uh, usually are, are controllable and um yeah and slower as well whereas a ballistic missile often gets shot right up into the higher sort of higher sky and then as it comes down it has a pretty pretty incredible terminal speed it can have and and you know it, that makes it more difficult to shoot down uh there are there are different ways of being able to do that often uh, well one one of the ways is by having a missile stick where it's going to be and explode in front of it and that shrapnel will take out the missile and other such ways but anyway ballistic missiles with what ukraine have outside of their top end air defenses like patriot uh, ballistic missiles are prove a much greater challenge for the ukrainians according to korostelev so the chap that, that said that quote before from the looks design the missile under development will be equipped with the onyx active homing head from the ukrainian company radio onyx in 2021, developers claimed that the Corral missile had a weight of 300 kilograms with a 25 kilogram warhead and a speed of 3,600 kilometers per hour. The Lutz Design Bureau initially stated a 30 kilometer range, but that was later revised to 100 kilometers in 2023. Uh, um, Korostilev also emphasized that the basis of, for the creation of the new anti aircraft missile was 70% complete. He underscored that the foundation of the development of the new anti-aircraft missile is 70% complete, including the detection and target designation stations, core missile components, software for the system, and the command and launch vehicle platforms. Bolstering air defences stands as a top priority for Ukraine's defence ministry. Yeah, so that is just a little bit more information on that missile. We're going to pop in to see what Anton Gerishchenko says to remind you he's a Ukrainian uh, advisor or to the Minister of Internal Affairs, um, and he says Russia's current combat and economic potential was built on three pillars: Soviet heritage, territory, resources, population, infrastructure, and most importantly, huge stocks of weapons. Two, money from the oil super revenues in 1999 to 2008. This money is also what solidified Putin in power. Three. Putin's political regime of total mobilization, lack of any real opposition, total control of the media propaganda uh, that provides complete support for war and readiness for mobilization. What happens to these pillars as Russia wages a war against Ukraine? This war, in reality, is Russia shooting its own leg because it undermines its own strengths. So, weapons. Russian military 
industry is not capable of producing as many weapons and ammunition as the whole Soviet Union. Old stocks still get used up or become unusable or too complicated to repair and they are less effective in the modern war. But North Korea and Iran can help replenish this deficit. I mean, as I keep talking about, this is where we're at at the moment, which is who can outproduce the other in terms of weaponry and equipment. And it's a real challenge for Ukraine that it appears that Russian drone manufacturing has significantly upscaled, that they are building tanks and, and IFEs, or at least they're re rebuilding old ones, at least to some degree. And of course, as, as he mentions here, they're getting stuff from North Korea and Iran, and a little bit of stuff from China as well, like those Desert Cross um, all-terrain vehicles, those very light vehicles. Uh, oil and gas revenues. So the European market that generated a large part of the super revenues is lost to Russia in a long term perspective. The EU will aim to diversify their oil and gas supplies as much as possible. Trade with India and China brings Russia revenue just by sheer volume of sales. But these countries demand discounts and preferences to which Russia has to agree. On the other hand, Russia has formed a huge shadow market of oil sales through third persons, a former shadow, a shadow tank of fleet helps Russia bypass sanctions. And actually, I'll, I'll go to that act on video, not at the end. I'll, I'll play it after this because I think it, it ties into some of what uh, Gerashchenko was saying there. Population. Due to many factors, both global and Russia-specific, there is no endless population in Russia like the USI seemed to have. Russia is not growing its population numbers, but Russia considers, on the other hand, the population of the occupied Ukrainian territory it's its own and sends these people to war against Ukraine. We do not know how or when the war will end. We do not know what will happen to in Russia, but without its endless stocks of weapons and endless money, to make new weapons, it will not be the threat it was in 2022 when Putin made the decision to attack. And that is a direct result of the work of the Ukrainian armed forces and the support from Ukrainian allies. Now, that's quite a positive outlook. The question is, does Russia have deeper pockets in terms of equipment, personnel and money than Ukraine? That's all it's going to come down to, really. It's going to be a mix of deeper pockets and type of weapons that can be brought to bear. So throughout this war, Russia has had some significant advantages in weaponry. And the ability to, to use that weaponry from within Russia and that be a safe haven for them. So they can fire cruise missiles or kinjals or whatever from air airframes inside Russia and Ukraine can't touch them. Now we're getting to a point where Ukraine is developing its own weaponry that can reach into Russia because allied nations aren't allowing them to use their weapons to reach into it. But also Ukraine are receiving weapons that are of a higher quality or high capability than Russian weapons. It, so we are seeing precision guided munitions like Excalibur being used more than the Russian equivalent. We are seeing high Mars missiles being used more than the Russian Equivalent. We are seeing ATACMs on the field now and hopefully things like GLSTB. On the other hand, Russia have guided glide, glide bombs. Ukrainians have JDAM, but they are they're not being used enough or they're being jammed, whereas the Russian aviation is able to use theirs with greater impunity. There are these little areas where one side has the advantage over the other, and I'd say Ukraine has had the advantage in drones. But I think Russia is clawing that back and closing the gap. And if they are making drones at the levels that some people are claiming, that is a real worry. Ukraine, in order to win the war, Ukraine has to eke out advantages where they can. So troops on the ground, it's going to be in terms of training. With equipment on the ground, it's going to be in terms of the fire control systems of tanks over the fire control systems of, of Russian old Soviet equipment. Uh, if, they, if they can have, if they can get Western tanks or upgraded older Soviet tanks with fire control systems, such as the T-72s coming from Czechia and so on and so forth, then that gets them the advantage. If they, one of the main things I think, which we often overlook or we don't talk about enough, is intelligence. So satellite imagery, real-time intelligence that is being provided by Western nations, which it has a huge advantage over the Russian capabilities which that allows Ukraine to 
but acquire targets, uh, time-sensitive targets, I think much better than the Russians can. Um, but the Russians have more humans. Russians have had much greater stocks of equipment. The question is, how much longer can they can they eke out those stocks? Can they draw from these huge caches of, of white degraded equipment? Nonetheless, if they can polish them off and get to the front line, that that is doing a job for Russia. But how long can that last? Particularly with regard to artillery and artillery barrels. As someone was talking in the threads about a documentary, a Rheinmetall documentary, how it takes like six to seven months to make a uh, a barrel, like a, a brand new barrel for a, I presume for a howitzer or whatnot. So you know, the, the, where Russia have got huge numbers of barrels sitting in fields that they can cannibalize, again, well, firstly, how, how many more of those do, do Russia have access to? They've done an awful lot of cannibalization already throughout this war. And also with regard to Ukraine, how how quickly can they get replacement barrels for their own box of howitzers, and so on and so forth. So in all these different areas, it's like here Ukraine has the advantage, here Russia has the advantage, here you know here there's parity, here the advantage is closing, and it's looking like the momentum is shifting the other way. What Ukraine need is advantages in more and more of these uh, categories in order to win the war. Um, Russia is catching up technologically with some of the things, as I said, that, that drones have been able to do, or the, the, the Ukrainian innovation. Um, scale is important, technology is important, capabilities are important, like technological capabilities, like electronic warfare. Who has the advantage? Yeah, well, Russia traditionally has had the advantage. But in certain areas on the field, battlefield at the moment, on the front lines, Ukraine has the advantage, for example, around Kherson, but not necessarily all across the front line. So can the Allies, I know this is one of the technologies the Allies don't really want to give Ukraine because there's a lot of pride and a lot of sympathy over electronic warfare capability, and, and they don't necessarily want to see that getting into the hands of the Russians. But if allies can provide Ukraine with some cutting edge jamming equipment, then that would be really significant in tipping the balance in that category, et cetera, et cetera. So here, I think Gerashenko's analysis is, is fairly positive for the Ukrainians, but I do think Russians have a lot of a lot more humans they can throw at the problem. And and after March the 17th, after the, that presidential election, it's going to be very, very, very interesting to see what Putin does and does go for a full mobilization and what that will mean for. Right, I'm probably a good time to dip into the, the segment I did, as I said yesterday, referring to a Joe Bloggs video. So over to me. I'm going to go to Joe Bloggs, who's just done a little, uh, done another video on the Russian economy. You might think that the Russians selling larger amounts of hydrocarbons to places like China and India, when you look at the data, you think, oh, they're, they're selling lots, you know, in, in real terms, lots of tonnage or cubic uh, cubic meters of this stuff to these other countries. Oh, they must be doing well. They must be able to fund their war well. Well, Joe Bloggs is not so sure and uh, has this to say about it. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video to talk about what's going on with regards to the actual cash that Russia is being paid for its increased trade with China and India. It's well documented that since the sanctions were imposed against Russia, it's managed to pivot and sell a huge volume of oil to China and India to make up for all of the lost business that it has with the West. And on paper, that looks great. It looks like Russia has done a good job of sidestepping the sanctions. However, as we've seen from the data in today's video, there comes a new problem for Russia. The fact that neither India nor China are prepared to pay in Russian rubles. They don't want to get involved in that currency at all. And rather than making payments in Russian rubles, they've stipulated to Russia that they will make their payments in yuan and rupees. And I think that's interesting in itself because it shows where the balance of power lies. 
Historically, if you're a major seller of oil, you would think that you're in a very strong position. You can dictate terms to whoever you want. However, Russia has a much more narrow market today than it used to have before it invaded Ukraine. And the volumes that India and China can buy are critical to making sure that the Russian oil industry doesn't implode. If Russia this is super, super important. So if, if sorry, Russia are selling maybe an increased amount of hydrocarbons to Russia and China, the first thing is Russia and China are, this is a buyer's market, right? And they know that, that Russia are unable to sell that to the rest of, or largely to the rest of the world, to the markets they previously sold to. And they know that they'll, they absolutely need to offload this because they need to keep the gas flowing they, for very practical reasons. Uh, they don't have the ability to shut off gas and, and so on and so forth. They, they, they can't store it. They absolutely need to sell this stuff, right? So they end up selling it at a really good good price for Russia and China uh, for India and China. So India and China are not only getting cheap hydrocarbons which then you know, on paper it looks like Russia is selling loads of this stuff which they are but they're not getting good money for it. But then the other thing is they're not using the dollar. So the dollar is the international currency and the great thing about the dollar is you can you can you know, take a payment in dollars for, for something you sell and you can go to another country, you can go to every country in the world and buy stuff. You can buy stuff off every country using a dollar and everyone uses the dollar is the international trade currency. Now, if India and China are saying to you, Russia, you, we are going to buy this off you, but hey, we're the one, you, you need to sell it to us. So first, you're going to sell it cheaply to us. Thank you very much. If you say no to this, by the way, go and find someone else to buy it. Go on, go, on, go and find someone else to buy it. Second, we're going to pay you in our currency. Now, the clever thing about that is, is that where can Russia go and spend those rupees? Oh, India. Literally, the only place they can they can sell is not an international currency for exchange. You you are uh, probably less so, but still not an international currency. So. Russia that now have a load of money that they can't use and because of trade surpluses because actually Russia don't buy as much stuff off China as China buy off them in terms of China and, and India are buying loads of these hydrocarbons Russia doesn't want to buy all this other stuff from China or India so they're stuck with a bunch of cash that is effectively like meaningless not doing anything or they have to buy everything off China and India. So China and India are laughing. Yeah, clever. Russia wasn't selling to those two countries. There is a very real possibility that it would have to cut down its production significantly. And that could cause major problems and potentially could lead to some of those oil fields becoming redundant if Russia didn't keep drawing oil out of the ground. And of course, India saying. and China are fully aware of this. They know that Russia is desperate to ship all of this oil to them. And as a result of that, they are dictating the terms to Russia. They're saying, we're not going to use Russian rubles, not interested in that. You can keep your Russian rubles for yourself. We will pay you in our currency. And as we've seen in today's video, there are two major problems that are now arising from Russia's perspective. The first is that from an exchange rate point of view, the Russian ruble has fallen significantly in value against the Yuan and the Indian rupee. And that means that in relative terms, Russia is now being paid less in Indian rupees and Chinese yuan than it was this time last year. So the value of the currency that Russia is receiving has gone down. But what's worse than that from Russia's point of view is that the tradeability of those currencies is far less than it was for the US dollar and the euro, which were the two currencies that Russia was predominantly being paid in before its invasion of Ukraine. So Russia is now building up a huge amount of Chinese yuan and Indian rupees. And realistically, the only countries in the world who want to deal in those countries are China and India. And from Russia's point of view, they have a huge trade surplus when dealing with both of those nations. Russia. So exactly what, what I then uh, then said earlier. So I, this is, I think, you know, good news for Ukraine, bad news for Russia. 
Someone said to me this morning, because I talked about LNG and about how if Russia send LNG through India and we buy LNG off, so liquefied natural gas off India, that is better than buying it from Russia because India then put the markup on that. They add the value to it by, I don't know, refining it further or whatever. So that's a bit like the oil price cap where we say, right, Russia can still sell oil, but it can't be any more than $60 a barrel. Uh, and that then means that you, the supply is still there, but Russia aren't getting much money. Well, it's kind of the same thing here, that actually it's not too much of a problem if we do end up getting LNG from Russia through India, because actually India are the one, that, the people that are going to be making the substantial money off that. And Russia will be selling that to India at an absolutely knockdown price and having to be paid in rupees as well. So it's that double whammy for Russia. Now, someone asked me today, I think it's Vigo, asked me, well, what's to stop India like passing some of that profit that we give pay to India back to to Russia and you've got to understand that India and Russia and China and particularly China they discussed this in Andrew Perpetua's live stream last night but it's absolutely really important to understand this I've said this a number of times China is motivated by self-interest you might think they're ideologically linked in terms of communism to to Russia but they're not like China aren't really communist they are Chinaist they have this hybrid version of communism which is like this kind of quasi capitalist communist like weird hybrid system and they and they they're basically interested in themselves so they they might you might think they're BRICS partners they're ideologically aligned to to Russia but actually they will do things in their own self-interest that will hurt Russia because it's all about them. Now, historically, when you look at the activities of the US and Russia, they have historically been acting in terms of ideology. So the US might do things in terms of capitalism and freedom and blah, blah, blah. If you look over the last 100 years and, and Russia in, in terms of you know Stalinist, uh, communism, so on and so forth. China is is not that they're not that ideology is like what will benefit China here right we're going to do that so when when and I'm sure that's the same with India so when you look at like will they pass on any of that profit through back to Russia then no India are going to be like yep we'll have that profit thank you very much we've got a billion people we've got to look after we don't give a damn about Russia effectively I mean who gives a toss about them their ideology like we are concerned about one billion people same with China one billion people we've got to feed those people we've got to keep them vaguely happy and we've got to manage one billion people and we're going to do that in a way we're going to we're going to operate in a way that is completely self-absorbed we can't be thinking about like doing stuff to keep Russia happy we want their hydrocarbons and actually we would quite like the eastern eastern stretches of of their uh, their country as well if you don't mind so if russia collapses china are happy right so there you go um i don't think any any money that we pay to india for lng will be passed on back to russia apart from what they're buying that lng for in the first place and that will be a knockdown price in rupees um so anyway I, I just thought that was worth sharing with you right and now just to really sort of finish the video off i'm going to first of all dip into this comment uh, and second of all just say something about kaliningrad uh this comment i thought was quite interesting worth sharing with you because it's trying to understand who who Biden is to understand his behavior historically over the course of this war, but also before this war, and how he might be changing for the benefit of, of Ukraine. So President Biden says, Chris W, President Biden has been on the dovish side of American foreign policy for 40 years. But this is President Biden. It's not like Biden has been slow to give weapons because he's just... You know, there's some kind of, I don't know, other reason, some kind of intransigence connected to something else. He is just naturally not a, a war hawk. So he has made occasional geopolitical forays into military support. But remember, he was the most senior guy in the Obama administration who counsels against, counseled against the Bin Laden raid. That's pretty much emblematic of his career. Don't misunderstand, I'm not a war hawk. I think the USA has been terribly overzealous in military adventures. I agree historically. It must be very difficult for Mr. Biden to become the face of military support, and yet he's having to do so versus Russia and increasingly versus China and in support 
of Israel. This goes against the stronger currents of his political philosophy. It's quite interesting, actually. So I'd, I'd like to know what's going on in his, in his head with regard to Ukraine. Very much so. But actually with regard to Israel, because that is a real hot potato. And he seems to be fairly strong in the support of Israel, which runs against quite a few democratic politicians and the the people who are who are protesting on the streets are almost certainly going to be more likely to vote democrat than republican and so it's it's a really difficult one for biden because if you go against israel then you're going to alienate an awful lot of people but if you go against palestine there's there's quite a few democrats who line to walk that one anyway president biden is reluctantly undergoing a major shift in his relationship with the u.s military industrial complex this will be a difficult transition for anybody think obama and his use of drones in the war on terror the less evil of boots on the ground or assassination by drone but especially for a senior citizen who has spent his life in preference for diplomacy and distaste of clandestine or direct military action Really, really well articulated point there. And actually, Obama, so I was very much in support of Obama. I know that will come hardly as a surprise to any of you. Uh, you know, taking over Bush is like, this. I was really hopeful for the US politics. But then, of course, when you don't control as, as towards the end, well, actually halfway through his tenure, when you, you don't control the the House or the Senate, the House of Representatives or the Senate, then you are in trouble and you are effectively a lame duck and unable to get the changes through that he wanted. One of the biggest criticisms that many liberals had against Obama was in the context of his use of drones. He massively, massively increased the use of drones in different conflict zones around the world. This was pretty controversial because they, they were causing quite a lot of collateral damage as well got to understand that you would rather use drones than pretty much any other form of weaponry to do things like that you either gonna you either don't do anything or you use planes dangerous and and uh, you know vulnerable for those for those pilots potentially uh, and actually they can't get to certain places as quickly uh, as as some of these drones Use troops on the ground, that's highly controversial and just not practical in many cases. Or this and that and whatever. Drones are actually a really good way of doing war if they can be done sensibly and without causing collateral damage. But unfortunately, they do and that's what people remember. And they ended up being fairly controversial for Obama. What was interesting though, and I I think I wrote an article on this years ago, I've certainly argued about this on a gazillion threads. What is really interesting is that loads of tr- pro-Trump supporters would ha- also have a go. So liberals had a go at Obama for doing that, but but Trump supporters also got hold of that in in certain um, in um, in certain forums or whatever, and w- would attack Obama for his kind of. Oh, Trump is against wars and, and Obama used all these drones and et cetera, et cetera. But actually, if you look at the data, the use of drones absolutely skyrocketed under Trump. So it, actually, it's just basically a really continual trend. And what you'll probably find, which is kind of exonerating both of them, is it's probably just a strategy of the Department of Defense. And, you know, it would have happened no matter what what POTUS you had in place. And so, dro- yeah, drone usage went up as they became more capable technologically um, and more prevalent and they would use more. It's just some kind of virtuous cycle that they end up, you know, getting used more more and more and more. And that is irrespective of, of the president. And it just so happens that the presiding president at the beginning of that, that tr- upward trend was Obama and then it was Trump. But what you can do is you can attack Obama for that. But if you do, you'd have to attack Trump even more because actually Trump took the the use of drones and, and multiplied it hugely. Really interesting data on that, as I've said, and interesting articles. 
or you go, do you know what? It, it's actually just a strategy of the American um, Department of Defense. So he says, he finishes by saying, there's your reason for the delay in emphasizing the local economic impact of military industry. He becomes what he wants, uh, wants suspicious of being. Interesting. He, so he's kind of been forced to become much more hawkish in in terms of war than than he ever would have wanted to have been, given that he was previously traditionally more of a dovish um, politician, a foreign, you know, interested in foreign diplomacy. But what's going on in Ukraine is is as as close to a full on war as the US is is going to get without going to war, and. But it's not just that, it's, it's all the stuff going on throughout Africa. It's stuff now happening in Venezuela, Venezuela that's looking pretty precari precarious. You know, it's what, what's going on in Israel and then places all around the world are forcing Biden to, to be a very different kind of politician. Uh, lastly, people have asked me about Kaliningrad and I could do a whole segment on why that is still uh, an a part of Russia, why it's this exclave. I would just be repeating stuff like this. So uh, there are plenty of videos, I'm sure, on YouTube. One by History Matters is a nice sort of animated one. Why does Russia own Kaliningrad or Königsberg? Sort of a leftover from the Prussian German uh, territory, but then became Russian. And then Lithuania didn't really want it. And Germany didn't really want it after reunification. It's just kind of remained. Uh, Russian, but it does have that usefulness for Russia in being geographically where it is on the Baltic Sea and right in the mix. Um, but anyway, you go and watch those videos; they'll, they'll give you m much more cogent, uh, a much more cogent appraisal of the historical situation. Than I could. So, thank you very much. Please take care of yourselves. Really appreciate all your support and I will be back with you at some point tomorrow. My boy does have a football match quite a long way away. Uh, I'll probably get out an early video and then my other videos will be much later in the day. I would speak soon.